Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute's Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is how we talk about politics. And joining us to talk about that is Arnold Kling, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute and author of The Three Languages of Politics. I think most of us, if you ask like how do we talk about politics in general, our response is something like angrily. <laughs> you know, we, there's vitriol and we all get mad about it and we yell at each other and whatnot. But you have I guess a, a more interesting theory than that, which you call the, the three languages of politics. Can you tell us just what that is? Sure. It, and it may relate to this intuitive notion that we talk about it angrily. Uh, when I listened to your podcast from a couple months ago on politics and primitivism, it struck me that maybe in the light of that, I should have called this the three war whoops of <laughs> politics. That these the were, rebel yell, yeah. The, uh, the, yeah, this is a, a tribal way of, of talking about politics. Um, and, and I want to make, make clear that these are – that I – using the term languages, I don't think th – these aren't three theories. These aren't three ideologies. These are – related to three ideologies. So first of all, I divide the world into three ideologies, uh, progressivism, conservatism and libertarianism. A lot of people just want to do two. I'm going to want to give libertarians a third a third one. Um, and the languages very briefly are axes of sort of what is good and what is evil. So what is most uh, Good on the progressive side is to be on the side of the oppressors. So there's this oppressor – sorry, on the side of the oppressed. Good. Um, yeah, what well, is good on the – for progressives to be a side on, of the oppressed. So there's a strong oppressor-oppressed axis. Uh, oppressors are bad. People who progressives hate, they accuse of being on the side of the oppressors. That includes libertarians and conservatives. Uh, people that they admire are people who they believe are the, on the side – of the oppressed. So they, you know, they like to occupy Wall Street because they think of it as being on the side of the oppressed. Then we have uh, conservatives whose axis is civilization and barbarism. So they view the worst uh, evil as going back toward barbarism. And part of the reason they're conservative is they think that we've accumulated uh, institutions and cultural norms that have taken us away from barbarism and any threat to those institutions and cultural norms uh, threatens to t take us back in the direction of barbarism. And so people who they regard as being on the side of going back to barbarism are, are their worst enemy and the people they admire are the people who have been the defenders of civilization. And uh, for libertarians, the axis is freedom versus coercion. So the evil are people who – uh, use the gov use government coercion, and the good are people who who fight uh, government coercion. And again, I, I want to emphasize that these aren't these aren't the essence of their ideology, but they are, I think, the way that they organize the world in terms of we, they, really good, really bad. Mm -hmm. So when they're really in their primitivist mode of thinking about politics. They uh, they fall back on these things. So it, it's uh, as a language. If you use that language, it's a way of uh, signaling to the people who agree with you. You know, this this is how we line up on this issue, folks. Uh, it's clearly oppressors versus oppressed, or it's clearly civilization versus barbarians, or it's clearly freedom versus coercion, and it's also a way of uh, castigating the opposition. Maybe you could give us – could you give us an example like take a, a particular one policy issue or one thing that we talk about when we talk about politics and maybe show how each of the three languages might approach it? Sure. Pick an issue. Terrorism. OK. So terrorism, um, that one's one of the more difficult ones for both the progressives and the libertarians I think because it's such an obvious – it obviously seems to fall into civilization versus barbarism. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the terrorists are barbarians, and we in, in civilization have to fight back. 
Well, let's take something like the Boston Marathon bombing, um, which um, – so it, it was easiest for conservatives to put it in their civilization versus barbarism story. And you could see uh, others having trouble. So the libertarians, you know, for when the, there was there, – there were complaints right after the, uh, the incident was resolved – uh, about the tanks the in the street, down, yeah. yeah, like we we had we had tanks in our streets in Boston, and people it's, under house arrest, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that they they tra- wanted to put it in the freedom versus coercion axis, and on the left there was uh, there was this marvelous piece where a guy wrote, uh, you know, I really hope it was a it was a white male who did it. <laughs> You know that sort of he wanted to to be done by an oppressor, someone who's legitimately in the oppressor class, a white male, as opposed to somebody who might be regarded as coming from the oppressed class, such as a Muslim. Mm-hmm. Are these like exclusive ways of looking at things, such that everything, if you if you're say a conservative, then everything is a matter of civilization versus barbarism, and you don't really think so much? Like you don't value freedom and coercion or oppressor oppressed as much or is it more just an emphasis of how we talk? Well, again, yeah, go back to the language story. So I don't think – I mean I think the ideologies are complicated and they allow for people to think along all these axes and all about other things as well. I mean there's certainly that, – that's not the only thing. But uh, sort of when a crunch comes and you need to reaffirm that your ideology is right – and to reaffirm that the other guy is wrong, I think these are the languages that people fall back on an amazing amount of time. And I think you I, I, the one of the reasons I like your theory so much is because we see it you can see how a, a word is used in a different way that evokes a different type of oppressor oppressor type of regime. I mean, immigration is one where you you got to look at immigrants as either being lawbreakers and, but or we talk about how we want to ban the word illegal. Right, we don't want to say the word illegal anymore. We want to use the word unregistered or <laughs> undocumented. undocumented worker because that sort of removes it from the civilization barbarism lawbreaker type of motif. Yeah, no, immigration is a, is a classic issue where people tend to look at it through the three languages. So the most important thing to a conservative is that they've broken the law, the illegal immigrants, and the most important thing to progressives is that these people, you know, are poor and come from poor countries. I mean if if the illegal immigrants consisted entirely of sort of rich capitalists, uh, it would be interesting to see how the progressives <laughs> yeah. would come out. They might they might very well uh, look at it be differently. Against it, yeah. um, and the uh, and for libertarians, you know, the, it's government coercion that's going to be kicking these people out of the country, so you know, they should be we, we shouldn't have the, the borders to begin with mm-hmm. in, in one extreme libertarian view. Yeah, it seems like you almost gave up a, with a theory to explain why pundits become bigger idiots over time. And, this, and that's one thing I read your book. It's like pundits are not actually in the place and they're not playing the game of convincing the other side as much. Right? It seems yeah, like. That's actually how I ended up writing – coming up with the theory and writing the book is that I just – the first thing I – the thing that I noticed that kind of made me go in that direction is that so much of what's written either in blogs or uh, in newspaper columns, if you think about it, it's just not going to convince anybody on the other side. Uh, it's not trying to change it, – it really wouldn't change the mind of someone who disagreed. It isn't designed to change the mind of the people who are on your side. And when I said, you know what it's really trying to do and this is really sad – is that it's being done to try to keep the people on your side from changing their mind. It's trying to make it less likely that people on your side will change your mind. That's the most uh, that it's, that's trying to accomplish. So I said, well, given that, you know, if, if I were a conservative trying to reinforce conservatives' views, how would I write? And then I came up with the civilization barbarism thing, and same with the others. Is it? So I mean you use words like it's designed to do these things or they're setting out to keep conservatives thinking one way as opposed to setting out to convince progressives or libertarians. Um, is it – do you think it's that conscious or do you think that it's also that you know if I'm, if I'm a conservative, so I'm naturally prone to see things in this barbarism 
versus civilization way, then when I go to construct an argument, the argument that sounds the most convincing to me, so therefore it might be the most convincing I think to other people, is going to be a civilization barbarism argument. Um, I think it's probably more the latter that that people people f- that that these are the types of things that they find convincing, and so they're. I think in some ways they're surprised that they don't convince other people. You know, so when when you know someone when. When the Weekly Standard headlines its post-Boston Marathon headline, Civilization and Barbarism, <laughs> I think they're surprised that that anyone would would, would think about it differently. Um, so, but I think that that comes a little bit from people talking among themselves. So, if you had a room full of libertarians, sooner or later they'll start, you know, getting animated. Oh, those people! All they wanted is power. All they want to do is strengthen the government and use power to, to you know, to to take away people's freedom, um, you get a bunch of conservatives together, and eventually they'll say, "Ah, oh, they're just a bunch of barbarian." You know, they just mm-hmm. want to destroy our civilized values. So, uh, so a little bit of you know, group reinforcement. I think a lot of it is uh, ultimately selection bias. So people who uh, are inclined to try to understand someone else's point of view and talk in a way that would persuade them. Are probably selected away from in the political columnist world, maybe even in the blogosphere. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's otherwise. I think it's it, it, it's a lot easier for me to uh, explain you know the, a Rush Limbaugh or a Paul Krugman by saying, well, this, that's what the market seems to want. People want reinforcement for their own point of view. They don't want their own point of view challenged. And they're really not that interested in people who can talk to other pe- to people on different persuasions and change their minds. So does this mean then that if we want if we want to be more effective in communicating our ideas, it would help us to learn these other languages? I'm thinking about so early on in, in the Free Thoughts broadcast, we had Matt Zelinsky on to talk, and he's from the Bleeding Heart Libertarians blog, and that they tend to speak to progressives. Kind of, it's a I mean, I don't know, it's their mission, but yeah. there's this sense that they're talking, trying to talk progressive into libertarianism. And one of the things that they do is emphasize, and he emphasized, the oppressive force. It's it's an oppressor oppressed axis. It's the the poor are being oppressed by the powerful controlling you know government and the powerful who are in league with government. And so we're talking this particular language. Yeah, I would say nice try, but. Um, <laughs> I think it's uh, – and I'm, I'm kind of careful at the end of the book saying I don't think this is going to magically enable you to persuade other people. I think I think first of all, people are just very suspicious. So they say, oh, yeah, but you're saying that but I know you're a libertarian. So you're really on the side of the oppressor and you're just – you just I, – I, I see through that. You, 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 got, you got that wrong. It feels inauthentic in the same way as when like the yeah. – the- uh, political parties try to speak to millennials by yeah. adopting or, their or when your parents come down and tell you that they like your band. I've heard those crazy new rock bands you're listening to. It just <laughs> yeah. you're not really speaking my language, Dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it, it, it yeah, it's hard to make that sound authentic, and I think it's not really the way progressives use the word oppressor, repressive, and they don't. There, I don't think they have. Any kind of natural inclination to think of government as an oppressor on economic issues. I think they're they're willing to think of it in terms of like privacy invasion, but that's that's an issue where libertarians and progressives are aligned to begin with. So the the feedback loop though is what what strikes me as interesting. We could talk about this as a method of, of sort of dog whistling or, or using the language of people that you're hanging around. You bring up libertarians, you know. When libertarians hang out together, the word statist often comes out in a way that it doesn't it doesn't come out around other people. Um, so it could be just a way of talking about it. But there's also some sort of feedback loop, I think, between the quality and nature of your beliefs and why you believe them in terms of the fundamentals, and then engaging in this type of rhetoric that maybe makes your changes your beliefs itself in terms of how who you think you're opposing, what the other side looks like to you in terms of homogenizing them into a, a group that's just against you. Yeah, no, I do think that one of the ultimate end stages is to um, you know not 
just think of these axes as sort of things in the abstract and there are evil people along the opposite axis, but you actually get to the point where you're convinced that anyone who is, who is in the group who disagrees with you actually ultimately is part of that evil axis. So uh, again, you know, read any Paul Krugman column and see him describe, and which he usually does, conservatives are libertarians and you know, it's clear that they're just oppressors and and that uh, you know that that's about all about as far as his thought process goes. Uh, and I was sort of disappointed to read uh, is it Jason Brennan's mm-hmm. book where he says, well, basically we have got conservatives who want to you know use we have a nanny state, and that's not the, again how conservatives would describe themselves. It's not a very generous way of talking about a them. police state. I think you said conservatives. Yeah, well, the oh. liberals want the the nanny state. The oh, conservatives want the police state. Okay, right, right. right. Okay, so yeah, that that, uh, yeah, that that's that's not a good way to open up a dialogue with somebody who, who disagrees with you, and it's also not a good way to educate the people who agree with you about what those ideologies really are about. Yeah, there's a general rule I use in a lot of different situations, which. Am, am I using any words to describe someone that they would not use to describe themselves? Yeah. Right, and, and the one I use all the time is "brainwashed" is a really good example. <laughs> and you say, "Well, you're just brainwashed." Yeah. No one ever says, "I'm brainwashed," <laughs> yeah. and it's a good indication of whether or not you're, uh, I guess, not speaking the right language or not categorizing their beliefs with enough uh, respect. Really. Yeah. Well, Brian Kaplan developed this phrase, an ideological Turing test. Uh, imagine that you were placed in a room, let's say, with a bunch of progressives. Could you articulate progressivism in a way that they would say, oh, yeah, that is? And I think that going back to your question about uh, Matsolinsky and the uh, poor yeah, and the poor being oppressed by government, I just – I don't think you could talk that way in a room among, among – Room of progressives and sound like a progressive. I think people would instantly tune in something and say, ah, "I didn't. I heard something a little weird there. I, I, I think we've got a, a traitor in our mix." Missed. Yeah. Something. If you say minimum wage law is oppressing okay. the yeah. poor, they're probably going to say, "Oh, he's a witch. Yeah. He's a witch. Get him." You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> get him, yeah. Get him yeah. Out yeah. Of here. Yeah. You can say, you know, there are studies that show that the minimum wage reduced. Reduces employment among low skilled workers, and you can be okay. But mm. yeah, you start using the language of oppressive on that one, and they're not going to. Well, or I mean, it seems anything that would shift whatever group you're talking to into the suspect class is going to be. I mean, yes. Because when you're arguing that government hurts the poor, especially these programs that are often designed to help the poor, then what you're really saying is you progressives who are supporting this, if it's true that the poor are being oppressed, are now a member of the oppressor. Yeah. Class in the same way that you know, conservatives talking about civilization versus barbarism, whatever their particular policy preferences are, those are never barbaric. Um, yeah. Even though, like as a libertarian standing outside of it, looking at policies that are preferred by American conservatives, many of them look awfully barbaric. Yeah, to or me. you could just you know, yeah, if you're against waterboarding, you could say, well, waterboarding is a pretty barbaric thing, and mm-hmm. uh, but that's not the that's not going to fly. That, that's not the way to to yeah. gain entree into the. Uh, or to you know, start to convince conservatives. Uh, your your rubric also reminds me of of one of the other virtues of it is that there are a lot of sort of pop sci political books out there, but many of them read as sort of attempts to explain why you're right um, through some sort of, of of language or caught in neuroscience. I, George Lakoff is a, uh, a neuroscientist who became a Democrat strategist and. Uh, he wrote a book called Don't Think of an Elephant and he had this whole theory that the reasons that conservatives were winning, um, I mean, he considered the last 30 years of conservatives being winning, yeah. was because they were using words like death tax rather than a state tax uh, that that put a spell on your brain and basically that he had to come up with an explanation for how anyone could believe this and his explanation was basically witchcraft. I mean it was some sort of you – know, I've, I've got into your brain and done witchcraft on it. Yeah. Lakoff is a very interesting character and I, I really want to distinguish – my project from his. Again, I'm not trying to explain why people believe they do or to summarize ideologies. I'm trying to summarize rhetoric mm-hmm. in some sense. I'm trying to sum- – or I think the war whoop story really is right. If we go – if we view politics as primitivism, as sort of getting – whipping your tribe up and into a frenzy, I think that is what I see these languages as doing. Um, but Lakoff, you know, his 
what, the first book that, of his that came to my attention, I think it was the, his first foray into the whole political stuff was uh, – don't that, think of an elephant. No, or? no. It was before that. It was oh, moral, po- moral, morals, yeah. moral politics. The daddy and the mommy. Yeah. System, yeah. So that the that that conservatives are this strict father morality, and uh, liberals have a nurturant parent morality, and so it was, it was very interesting. It, it, it's um, I think he probably is on to something that um, that rhetoric of a nurturant parent that you know. People can succeed if they're given all the resources they need is rhetoric that appeals to a progressive. And I think the strict parent, you know, people need to be punished if they step out of line. It, you know, that has a conservative thing, you know, it appeals to conservatives. Where I think he flew off the rails is that he then proceeded to do – look at studies of parenting and say that nurturant parents is a better model. OK, fine. Maybe that's true. I'm not going to argue with it. But then to say, well, therefore, conservatives are clearly wrong mm-hmm. uh, as if the analogy between a family and government is 100 percent perfect. And so any way that you run a family that's better is clearly the better way to run government. It's like, whoa, how did you make that leap? And mm-hmm. you know, he, yeah. he, he came to a class of mine in law school one time. Because my professor was friends with him, and uh, uh, he gave his, his little his shtick, and, and I, again, it it has some validity to it up to a point, and then it sort of crosses a line into now I'm explaining why they're crazy and we're sane, and then you start to look at it and say this now you're just part of the problem. You're not explaining anything. You're part of the problem. And he he, he stood up there and he and he he said the problem with Democrats is that we're too rational. <laughs> And I, th- and I and I was uh, my head was spinning not not because I think Democrats are inherently irrational but it goes out to my my comment about uh, you know if you if you're, if you wouldn't call yourself it yeah. then you're probably playing some different game you'd be like well well as a Republican I'm irrational yeah that, you, yeah that's you, why I'm you, Republican yeah exactly yeah. and everyone thinks that their beliefs are too complex to say in in bumper sticker logic that's what you say they have bumper sticker logic we have very complex and deep seated reasons for believing what we want to do and that's exactly one thing he told me he said conservatives can put their logic on a bumper sticker whereas i need a bumper sticker that's huge that explains how complex my beliefs actually are so again it's still just yeah, yeah i think everyone believes that and there's um and one of my favorite pieces of literature that i cite in the book is um, – and I'm forgetting the term the guy used for it. But basically we believe that we have – we understand our opponents better than they understand themselves. Um, that uh, That's just a very powerful belief. He wasn't even talking about it initially in terms of politics. Uh, you know, that any, anyone that you happen to be on the other side, we believe that they, we understand them not only really well but better than they understand themselves. We understand their true motives. And if you're at that point, it's almost hopeless for you to be able to uh, engage. engage or accept any possibility that their ideas are correct or anything. You're, you're, you're really that, – that's really far gone. I'm curious about the civilization barbarism as the conservative and the um, – the freedom coercion as the libertarian distinction because I'm thinking of a lot of conservative rhetoric of – you know, especially since Obama came into office and then the rise of the Tea Party but – and then the way they talk about – conservatives talk about say Obamacare. There's, there's a huge amount of freedom language going on there. You know, They want to coerce you into having the government's choice in health care, they want to take away your freedom to do this. The Tea Party is very much steeped in the language of freedom and liberty first. Is that – are they – is that a, a change in conservatism? Is it a different kind of conservatism or are they using those terms say differently than the way that libertarians do? Um, I think there's some overlap but Probably not much. There's also a lot of rhetoric on Obama that sort of makes him out as being on the side of barbarianism. Uh, so mm-hmm. the, the you know, you've Even seen the Kenyan that. thing to some extent. You could say the Kenyan thing. You could say is almost part of that. Yeah, and the um, you know the recent uh, issue of you know being you know the the Crimean situation. You know, is you know I kind of look at it and, and say, well, you know. 
it's a lot closer to Russia than it is to us. I don't, I don't know what I would do about it if I were president. But uh, the idea that you know, if, if he were more of a defender of civilization, that this would not have happened, um, is you know very much part of the conservative rhetoric. And uh, you know, some of them were you know raving right-wing talk show hosts who say that will actually say, well, this is what Obama is trying to do. He's trying to undermine America. And uh, and and I think there's been a lot of conservative rhetoric that you know we need to take back our country. That's that is I think a dog whistle along the uh, civilization barbarism axis. Yeah, and that would be the I mean the talking constantly about the Constitution. The Constitution yeah. represents kind of the high water mark. The Constitution, as the founders yeah. saw it, represents the high water mark of civilization, and Obama is trying to undermine that, and so that's a deviation yeah. from. Yeah, and it's interesting. So, so libertarians and conservatives can align on the Constitution, but the libertarians, you know, what is important to them is their reading of it. And its use as a way to, to constrain government power, and I think as for conservatives, it's, it is more of a symbol of, of civil, civilization of the tradition. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think Aaron's question about using the term freedom is interesting too, because you even heard this in Obamacare debates, and you still hear it to some extent today. Uh, well, what is freedom if you might have a catastrophic health care problem, and then you won't be free to? Pay for that on your own, on your own ability, uh, which I, again maybe them just trying to co-opt the supporters of Obamacare, trying to co-opt freedom rhetoric and say, "Come on board, freedom lovers," and us saying, "I don't think that word means what you think it means." Yeah. Well, yeah. that was the argument um, when the, the study came out that showed that Obamacare would increase um, unemployment; that it, people would mm. would leave the labor oh, right. market. That, that, <laughs> that this was this was the freedom to not work yes, yeah, being yeah. enhanced <laughs> by this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your comments about Obama too, um, uh, and making him on the side of barbarism. I, I think one of the fascinating things that that you've seen with Obama has been a, the pathologizing of Obama. This and this happens a lot, as you said. We think we understand our opponents better than they understand themselves. So you have to come up with some deep seated mental reason such as Dinesh D'Souza's post-colonial explanation of how <laughs> yes, you know, to try and explain why Obama is the is a milquetoast liberal politician who advocates the same physicians they've been advocating for 20 years. We need to give him a psychosis because yes. he doesn't have reasons. He has pathologies. Yeah, well, and but as you were saying earlier, that's kind of the favorite thing of academic uh, psychologists is to say, well, you know, conservatives, you know, basically you were born with a fear of spiders and ultimately that turns you into conservative. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if this makes – because you, you said you kind of refrain from drawing conclusions about how we ought – like so we ought to change our language in a certain way or here's or you know here's ways we can now try to talk to each other. But I'm wondering if – does this represent something that's making our political lives worse? Because it's not so much if, – if this is true, then it's not just that we disagree with each other and that we can disagree with each other over really important things but that on top of that – we can't even talk to each other about it in a meaningful way. It's it's not. I, I would phrase it. To, I'd say that the the problem is that we layer onto it so much of, and I'll go back to your primitivism. So much tribal um, us versus them. Uh, yeah, that, and that we make it. Uh, we make the disagreement. We uh, make the disagreements more emotional and more intense, and put and much higher stakes on them. Than we need to. So if, if I were to prescribe anything to people, it'd be like, you know, the ideal thing is, so if everybody in the world read this book and took it to heart, they would take a step backward every time they hear these sorts of dog whistles. Especially that when the dog whistle comes from their own side and say, "Aha, uh -huh, this is just a dog whistle from my own side." But you know, let, let let's see it analytically. Let's imagine what this would look like from other people's point of view. Let's see if I can look at the facts, and you know, I mean, I'm I'm not promising I would all of a sudden change my libertarian views. I'm not inclined to, well, but uh, at least it would, I think it would be a step forward if people uh, recognize that. Oh, I'm responding to a dog whistle here. Wait a minute. Let me, let me try to take a broader view. You you say that these don't, you know, it's not these don't like define the underlying ideology, right? right? But what I'm wondering is so. 
Yeah, so progressivism, the ideology is not one of just oppressor oppressed. Um, that there's there's a whole aspects to it that yeah, then a, define the belief what in these human things. progress. Right. That's part of um, progressivism and conservatism has all these things. But but libertarianism, I mean, really reduced to its core, just is a focus on freedom versus coercion. I mean, especially if you take the kind of really you know the the more extreme views, like so a strict like non-aggression right. principle libertarian is going to say, well, all there is to my ideology, in fact, is freedom versus coercion. So I can't really talk about anything else when it comes to politics because that's all there is to it. <laughs> um, that might be true of somebody who's uh, sort of comes at it from what I call the philosophical point of view. But there, there's also people come at, at it from the pragmatic point of view. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my favorite uh, thinkers, Jeffrey Friedman, says that Libertarians tend to like when one fails, they fall back on the other. So when they're saying, you know, philosophically, you know, the non-aggression principle, the non-aggression principle, and, and then something comes up that maybe that principle just doesn't uh, doesn't completely say that, then they fall back. Well, but on a practical level, when you allow more freedom, uh, people, you know, you get more economic growth, and and, and people are better off, and uh, Conversely, the people who you know, are libertarian more for the well, you know, you get more economic growth, people are better off. Uh, when they come across an issue where maybe that doesn't work, they fall back. Yeah, but mm -hmm. philosophically, people ought to be free. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so in any case, I think those are, are those two pillars that uh, sort of uneasily support libertarianism. There's the empirical case for free markets producing better results and then there's the philosophical, you know, that no one should be uh, able to force somebody else to do something against their will and people kind of go back and, and forth with those two. Well, I do think it's true that, that when it comes to the moral languages of politics, uh, we don't spend as much time talking about the efficacy of markets as we do talking about the problems of of freedom versus coercion and, and why a, a life well lived is without coercion or with as little coercion as you possibly can. And I think – honestly, I think libertarians make more progress with non-libertarians uh, when they make the utilitarian case for for libertarianism rather than the absolutist, rightist, you know, natural rights case. Yeah, and, and speaking for myself that – uh, I've considered myself a libertarian for a, quite a long time, but until I came in here and started hanging out with a lot of libertarians, I was pretty much entirely just consequentialist and didn't have a big anti-authoritarian streak in me. I'm not very anti-authoritarian. Uh, I've become more anti-authoritarian as I hang around people <laughs> speaking the same language of anti-authoritarianism. There's the, well, we shouldn't really make people do this because it produces bad outcomes. And then there's the, don't tell me what to do type of attitude, which I think it, it brings out – libertarians bring that out in each other. It's interesting. I, I, I think my background, my personality was very anti-authoritarian all my life and I came to my libertarian policy beliefs rather late. So <laughs> different the, the direction. Side. Different direction. So the question here is also what – so what do we do? That doesn't seem like there's very much of an audience for – sort of plain spoken, non dog whistling uh, type of pundits out there. It, it seems like the the world is spreading apart and there's not a place for people who want to have a nice di discussion about the issues. No, I I, th I think we should become depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, no, I don't. That, that seems to be my conclusion in every every uh, every time yeah. every, every time I'm in a public setting. My conclusion. Let's let's all get depressed. Well, have you done? Have you looked at this historically? Like looked at the arguments from say 100 years ago to see if these same sorts of things are there or if it's getting worse or I, – I was very careful in the book to, to say this is contemporary. I didn't want to rule out that it was true historically but I didn't want to make any claims like that that would immediately get me shot down by somebody who understood you know, the history of political philosophy better than I do. Uh, it would be interesting to take something – I hadn't – I didn't read – I read – Yuval Levin's book on uh, Burke versus Payne. Oh, the new, the great debate. Yeah, yeah. and it'd be interesting. I, I I should have like said, you know, 
as I read it, I should have like looked for passages that lined up this way, but I didn't. I don't. I didn't do that. I, I have to go back and see. Well, I think some of this could definitely be tied in. I mean, well, we can we can talk about how it's, how you talk about it, how we talk about it, but also the f more fundamental issues of why do we believe what we believe, and some of the stuff like John Haidt's work on on the fundamentals of political psychology that there are, you know, is this fair, is this unfair, is this disgusting, is yeah. this not? Those are what really undergirds our sense of that this is wrong or, or not. And then we get involved with groups and start using words to rally each other around ideas, around the white hats versus the black hats. And yeah, I, I think I, I have mixed feelings about that. I, I, um, I, I certainly like a lot of what, what Haidt has done. I'm not... I particularly didn't feel like the um, the disgust, uh, the, you know, the, the extent to which people feel disgust was works the way he thinks it does. I did, it, it, because you know, I, I look at the progressives' attitude to things like uh, obesity or gen genetically modified organisms. And I say, if that's not a disgust issue, you know, what is it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess, yeah, um, it's certainly with ge you know, genetically modified organisms. It's really hard. You know, the, the utilitarian case is almost all against them. The scientific case is almost all against them. So, you know, to me, seeing that, thinking that I know my opponents better than they know themselves, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they think that that's, that's a disgust issue. Uh, I also, um, you know, there's... The, the 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 attempts to explain conservatism in these kinds of psychological terms, like this isn't height, but uh, people who I think feel like they're carrying his banner uh, say that like conservatism it has to do with is fundamentally about endogamy that you're you know you don't want to marry out, see marriage outside your tribe, and so you know that give, leads to your Views on immigration, it leads to your views on uh, sex, and so on, and that. Um, that seems struck, like a dog whistle itself. Yeah, that's that struck me as too much of a stretch. Just stretch because you know I, I don't, I don't quite get how that explains like you know conservative views on foreign policy or for free markets or yeah, it just it, it you know the, throwing that all into the. Endogamy story seems like way well, too much. That's one of the things I like about your way of looking at things, as opposed to, say, Heights, which for those who aren't familiar with this, that he's a psychologist and he gives people questionnaires on moral questions and has them talk about you know whether they think this is morally right or wrong, and uses those to tease out their views on what he calls the moral foundations, which are things like disgust and purity or. Authority, um, freedom, and freedom, freedom and, and, and one of them. harm, um, fairness, and his his thesis then is that different political groups kind of feel more of an affinity towards certain foundations than others. So conservatives are pulled more by things that represent authority issues than they are by fairness issues, and also disgust for them too. So yeah. um, and but I agree with yeah, Arnold. So, so but I think yeah. I think one of the the issues with this is exactly the one that. You got at with disgust, um, and when I reviewed the book for the Cato Journal, I made a similar sort of argument that he he says, you know, so he puts these questions out there, meant to provoke fairness or not, um, and then says, you know, con progressives score high on fairness, which is then why they support these given policies because these are policies that are about fairness. And as a non-progressive, I look at them and say, no, I I support fairness, but I believe that these are not fair. You know, I, I approach. I'm looking at the policy differently as opposed to the moral foundation. I think what makes sense in opposition to that about your theory is that we the the underlying policy preferences, because this is one of the problems with Heights' theory, is it doesn't seem to fit with policy preferences changing within these groups over time. Yours allows for this, so they could, you know, conservatives can oppose the individual mandate on all of these grounds when it's a Democrat doing it. But when it's a Republican doing it in Massachusetts, <laughs> they they can support it totally. And your theory says doesn't it, and, that doesn't cause a problem for your theory. And, and in part, that's because Romney's rhetoric was this is going to keep the people from abusing the emergency rooms. And uh, ah, that's barbaric. People using the emergency rooms and not paying for it. Ah, oh, this is this is good. 
mm-hmm. um, whereas o- Obama was using using different rhetoric for it. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I, and let me uh, cite another thing that Jeffrey Friedman insists, suggests that you not try to reduce anyone's point of view, that you don't take a reductionist attitude, say you believe this because, just say, all right, take their beliefs on face value, just whatever, you know, just use that as an, as an operating principle, take the beliefs at face value. And so I, I wanted to be careful of the book and say, well, you know, I'm not trying to explain why a progressive believes what the, what they want to do. I'm just saying when you, once you form your beliefs, however you believe them, when you're trying to whip up your own side, you're going to end up falling back on this kind of rhetoric. And I think that that's, that brings them with sort of good thinking habits of, of taking what they say on their face and not trying to dig down into them. And I tell people all the time that you know you have to believe that or you need to understand that the other side has good arguments they don't just have uh, idiocy uh, they have good arguments and you won't be able to combat them if you don't think that those are good arguments all these things that go into good thinking and you can feel sometimes you can feel yourself get pulled into the dog whistle camp and say and, and the bad thinking comes in and you say okay I need to stop that yeah. well actually and I, now I remember the term I was looking for for that thing which is the law of asymmetric insight the belief that you understand other people better than they understand themselves and uh, that's um, yeah that's what I'm trying to kind of you know avoid slipping into and it's it's very easy to to uh, to slip into that one in the uh, and, and also just as an aside I think that the some of this political psychology ends up doing that ironically. Yeah. These, these are psychologists. They're supposed to understand these things but they are actually probably guilty of asymmetric insight in sort of thinking that they understand the conservative mindset better than you – know, that they don't need to take conservative points of view at face value. So then I know that you have resisted the kind of normative conclusions from your book instead of just describing the way things are. I'm not giving recommendations on then how to change the way we talk. Um, in order to be more effective or – but but are you in a sense saying the solution, one thing we should do is not try to adopt necessarily, try to adopt the other side's rhetorical style when talking to them or try to you know adopt all three but instead to try to step outside of this, that it's a negative normative yeah, sense? Yeah, and, and, and certainly restrain your own rhetoric. So um, uh, you know, at the, the most extreme use of the rhetoric – you know, let's say for a libertarian, it would be to say that all they want is power. Just say, OK, no, wait. I'm going to step back and take what they say at face value. I'm concerned that if we followed through on that policy that we would be ending up with more government power and more coercion. But I'm going to take at face value that that's not the fundamental purpose of it. Uh, so that – and then uh, in terms of your own rhetoric, just – there's, there's no need to sort of whip your side into a frenzy over these issues. So if the NSA spying thing comes out, you don't have to sort of jump up and down and scream, ah, that's coercion, that's going to get rid of freedom. You can say, well, what, 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 what can we do about that? I guess they, you know, these people are very concerned about terrorism. Uh, that's probably a legitimate concern. But – you know what? What is it about this that might be different? And you know, for example, in that particular example, David Brin has a very different take on that, which is that hey, you know, the technology is here. You know, the um, your your ability to stop anyone from using that technology it's it's, it's unlikely. Uh, what we need is more symmetry in the ability to use it. So. We should, you know, we should have as much uh, of a window into government as government has into us, and that's a very, you know, difficult point of view to accept. It's difficult for the super uh, people who, who privacy to, to, yeah, to, to, to privacy advocates or people who fear government to say we're going to give government that power, and somehow the fact that we have transparency into them is going to be good enough to counteract that, and then. You know the people in government, <laughs> transparency. You know what? You, you're going to watch us. You know the the, the police are are going to be filmed while they're doing their job. That's you know. Yeah. Yeah. No. The, in um, our episode that we did with Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch, uh, he had a 
a line. Nick had a line that said, you know, we should avoid the soda tax Buchenwald type of arguments <laughs> yeah. that the, the soda tax is, is the same as, as a concentration camp or this is the beginning of the yeah. end of human civilization, which we're prone to. And I always say it would be amazing if we could actually discuss these issues on the margins as opposed to the extremes, which is something that I bring up in my primitivism, primitivism of politics stuff, which is very similar to what you say, extremifying your opponent, homogenizing them and not actually addressing the fact that there's close calls between you two on the margins. Uh, I do that in, in gun policy all the time. I'd rather debate on the margins than on the you, – you want a rocket launcher versus you want to disarm every person on the planet. Let's have a fight in the middle of that. That's not even a good debate. Yeah. Yeah. You said you haven't really looked at this historically, so we can't we can't talk about trend lines of this is getting worse or it's getting better than it used to be. But I'm still curious if you have any opinions about whether the way government currently is, whether the size, the scope of its powers, the kind of policies we have, the kind of policies that we argue for, make this problem potentially worse than it might otherwise be. Yeah, no. My instinct is that it's it's worse. Uh, it's worse than it was. I can you know I can even remember the '60s when politics was quite polarized, and I think in some ways it's worse. Um, you know, there was definitely a more of a violent fringe back in the '60s, and that's something that was concerning. But um, I think what is worse is that people feel more threatened by the notion that they might have to change their minds. So, you know, in the '60s, an awful lot of people changed their minds about the Vietnam War, and you know, they were able to deal with that. And um, in the 70s, a lot of people changed their minds about the uh, um, usefulness of wage and price controls. You know, they tried it and pretty much everyone now agrees that that experiment didn't work. And it, Deregulation it, too, it, yeah. also with the, in the late 70s. Yeah, um, that was – yeah, they, they going, the deregulation of transportation you know, involved changing minds. Now I think people – I think on – and this is true on all sides but um, I certainly notice it on, on the progressive side maybe because you know, I want to believe that their own self-image, that they're the reality-based, intelligent, well-educated group. Uh, I get the sense that they – that, uh, and this is uh, accusing them of uh, – Psychological, but they're having a harder time changing their minds. So I think that the trend is, I think, to use these languages more and more, uh, and that is either coincident with or causing a resistance to changing one's mind. Um, I mean, I would. I, um, I guess I, I wish I could come up with, with more issues on which I felt libertarians and conservatives needed to change their minds. Um, the drug war for conservatives would be potentially yeah, well, one. And that's one that which one, 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 some of them have. Yeah, I think – well, maybe immigration would be a yeah. classic one, that, that uh, getting uh, conservatives. So there, there's an interesting one where I have a feeling that the Differences between the elite and the mass are kind of the, the more important than any of the kind of the ideological ones. Um, but I can certainly think of things where, you know, I think uh, there's room for progressives to change their mind, like the effectiveness of fiscal policy, you know, of big deficits on you know, improving the economy. I mean, the you know, they're really dug in on that. I think that those of us who don't agree that deficits really help the economy grow and reduce unemployment, that we're just out to screw the unemployed um, or that we have no sense of science at all. And yet, you know, I think an objective reading of the data would say, boy, that's really a questionable call whether that makes a difference. It seems like, you know, we ran a huge deficit and unemployment went up. We had the sequester and these things that they that the progressives say, oh, that's going to cause you know it's austerity, it's going to cause a recession. And the economy did okay, um, so I think that that's part of a general trend for people to dig in 
and the, the, your question of sort of why that you know why are people digging in more? One possibility is it's structural that the government has become bigger, more important. That that that's that's a, it's a very comforting idea from a libertarian point of view. Hey, True, they, they wouldn't have these fights if uh, if government weren't so big. Um, I'm more inclined to take a uh, soft cultural view that people, f for whatever reason, have taken on their political beliefs as a stronger part of their identity. So, and my evidence for that would be something like on Facebook: the amount of, po of political stuff, even from I have you know, friends from just that I, I friended because they were they were my high school friends. So it's not like, you know, I mean, it'd be one thing if if all my friends were people from the Washington area who I knew from my, you know, political, political activities, economic, yeah. you know, these are people that, you know, just happened to went, gone to high school with and they're like posting, you know, their political rhetoric or people that I worked with when I had my business uh, and, you know, we had no political discussions at all but, you know, with, with, with their Facebook posts are all political. So I think people are uh, – it's, it's a bigger part of their identity – and again, I go back to the 60s and 70s. You know, people identified. You know, they there was the jocks versus the long hair, jocks versus greasers, <laughs> and uh, there were these. You know, all these cultural divides and so on. All these ways of people identified themselves, but uh, it wasn't all politics. Uh, and I think that the. The salience of politics and people's identity has gone up and that is creating this kind of extreme polarization I think, and or is coinciding with it. I think that's one of the real – one of the real dangers of that is that the difference between you know, the various cliques, you know, if you're part of a clique in high school or you identify very strongly as like a Boston sports fan versus New York sports fans or whatever, these other kinds of – Aaron does by the way. Yeah. <laughs> or Patriots. Well, yes. yeah. um, but is, is that those are relatively harmless lines to draw upon, you know. So I can – I can like totally hate the New York Jets and think that there's something just like – Morally deficient with their fans, which you do treat yes. them at. at a Otherwise, Ross they Steve. wouldn't be Jets fans. Yeah. But you know, that's I'm not. I don't see those people <laughs> as enemies. But the difference is when we start getting our cultural identity from politics. Is that those that it, it, there are policies attached to those, and those policies end up seeing us forcing other people to live. You're in libertarian, the line. <laughs> but but that that it. I think it encourages us to see each other as when we identify politically as opposed to along these other lines. It encourages us to see each other more as enemies than we might have otherwise, yeah. which I think is then a deeply harmful. I think the fewer people you see as your outright enemies, probably the better your life is going to go. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, you know, this circles back to sort of the politics as primitivism issue. That yeah, I think it, I, I'd much rather see people's primitive urges go into. You know, sports stadiums than in politics, but maybe that's just my libertarian in inclination. I mean, my inclination is, is to think that you know, if if you had a continuum of primitivism and 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 uh, uh, maybe civilization or just civilization uh, yeah, something, <laughs> yeah, right, peacefulness, um, that you know, the most you know civilized way to live is live and let live. You know, if uh, if your idea of a good day is to curl up with a good book inside, and my idea of good day is to take a hike in the woods, so we each do our own thing, and that's you know, that just seems like the most civilized way to live, and um, and the most primitive is for us to beat each other up, and then somewhere in between, we could take votes and you know do things like that, um, and I guess I think that the taking a vote is closer to the – or maybe that's kind of your insight is that taking a vote is closer to the beating each other up than it is to the live and let live. Depends um, on what you're voting about, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I liked your comment though about – you know, and I think about this as I'm, I'm working on the, the book on this, the – that <clears> – <throat> You know, you don't want to make sure that you're just justifying your libertarian view of the world in terms of this uh, this rubric you set up, which is a, a point well taken. But when you bring in the social aspects and comparing how much of your identity might be tied up with politics, that's a very good point because this also could be tied to 
the diversification of culture across the board, the, the long tail effect of there being you know, not three networks anymore, not three bands anymore. Not, there were more than three bands, but there are just more and more things that you can do and that means that there are more things that you could assign – uh, a group mentality too. So it, but, but, Trader Joe's versus this, they right. start to have political ramifications. Whole Foods has political has a political undertone to it. Trader Joe's does that. That if you shop at a different type of grocery store, maybe it doesn't. And even bands and even uh, those. But but, but you know you, it, that could have worked out the other way, right? It could have worked out that people's political heat turned down as they became more and more engaged in these other things mm -hmm. and. With these, you know, wider opportunities, and one of the things that I remember Tyler Cowen writing writing a blog post about is that, you know, if there are a lot of areas to compete in, then there are a lot of different status games to play. And, you know, and, and you know, I may be the best, uh, you know, connoisseur of a certain type of music, uh, and that, you know, and, and I may have a tight in group of people who who take my recommendations on that music and that's a great um, you know that that you know in terms of you know my view of sort of a civilized versus primitive view that that would give a, you know give us a more civilized life where we're less likely to run into conflicts with each other is that people is there are enough status games so that everybody can feel their high status at something but if you put all the load everything into politics that seems like well, why would you're bound to make a lot of people unhappy. It, let me push back just a bit on this on the kind of social science aspect of all of this a bit. I just say what – we're having this conversation very much in the beltway right now and I know you said like you see more political posts from your Facebook friends but that could be because that's become like the thing one does on Facebook or you know, when you post on Facebook, you get these little – you know, it tells you how many people responded and political things may get just more responses than you know, here's an article about bird watching or whatever. And so it's, it incentivizes stuff like that. But, but is it possible that we living here in the Washington, D.C. area are to at least some extent overreading how much people identify culturally with political groups and that maybe – Outside in the rest of America, yeah, they. I mean, they can identify as Democrats or Republicans, but they're not thinking about it that much, and they're not identifying. Yeah, so so they're not you know, like reading the newspaper, or looking at the web, and when they see something that's threatening to their side, getting all like, oh, I got to do something about that. I got to I got to write my blog post. To or they're just not the reading blog. the newspaper and and reading yeah. political pundits as much as we are. They live a normal life. Yeah. I, well, certainly that's true. I mean, you can just see in terms of the uh, you know, the percentage of non-voters and how that goes, you know, Obama just complained about this, how that goes up during off-year elections. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's true, but I think it's still kind of scary to the extent that, to me, the extent to which, at least among highly educated people, that there's a lot of identity. I mean, I just you know see it in in friends. I mean, I you know I don't know if you get this experience, but I get this experience up because I have you know just about all my friends are on the left, and so he's sitting around a dinner table, and you know eventually the conversation comes back to how miserable the conservatives, the fact that. You know, the conservatives make them feel and how angry they get. And it's like, you know, you just want to crawl under the chair. <laughs> I want to thank you, Arnold, for coming on Free Thoughts today. And I wanted to close by just asking if our listeners have found this really interesting. Of course, they should buy the book, The Three Languages of Politics. It's only about 50 pages, so it's, it's definitely worth it. But then is there somewhere they can, say, find you online to get more of your thoughts? Well, I have a web blog that's called Ask Blog, but I think if you Google Arnold Kling blog, sooner or later you get there. I used to, I used to blog elsewhere, but sooner or later you'll find this Ask Ask Blog. And if you see if you see a blog with current posts only by me, then you, you know you found it. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.